Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to the channel. You'll see behind me, this is a 48 by 80 shop. And I will turn this into probably a full time-lapse build, but I'm not gonna be doing a daily build series build on this project. I've done other daily build series on very similar projects, so I didn't wanna bore you guys, but I also wanted to use it as an opportunity to share with you maybe some individual little like tutorial type videos. And today I thought, I've never really shared with you guys the process of installing our permanent bracing. So the stuff up in the trusses that stays there forever and adds to the rigidity of the structure. Now, before I get into the video and the meat and potatoes of our permanent bracing, I wanted to also say that this video is a sponsored video. ITW Pazload has partnered with RR Buildings for the year in the process of showing you guys our permanent bracing. I'm also going to share with you some of the benefits to the Pazload fuel battery combo system as the power source for their tools, their cordless tools. I'm going to share with you some of the kind of unique differences, the perks and benefits to using the Pazload system over a battery only system. So let's get into it. Now, before we talk about permanent bracing, I guess I should start by kind of explaining what the point of this video is. So if you are installing a truss and let's say you're going to build yourself a little garage and you've got a bunch of trusses to put up, um, if that truss is not installed properly, it's actually not very strong. So the bracing is what holds it up, keeps it rigid and able to do its job. Now, behind me, you'll see our trusses up in the air. They're bearing all the weight of that roof system. So when we install our trusses, we're gonna use temporary bracing first. So you've probably seen the chains. If not, you can look back behind me and maybe see some of the chains that are hanging down from our trusses. We'll put those up temporarily just to hold the building tight Imagine if you were to take all of the skin off of your body, your bones would crumple into a big pile. Well, a building like this is somewhat the same, and until we get the skin on our building, which is gonna give us all of our diaphragm strength and all of our bracing, a big windstorm could come and knock this building down. Trusses are very weak until installed properly and braced properly. So with that being said, I'll take you up into the roof system and I'll show you some of the things that we do. Here's our truss, and as you can see, if I move it and without a lot of effort, the bottom cord is not very stiff. Now, I've actually got some of our framing already installed. Greg worked on that yesterday, and we're gonna be finishing it off. These, what we're installing now, are called wind ties. So I'll show you what we do. So just to get it out of the, uh, out of the comment section, because I know I'm gonna get asked that question, uh, your building is moving a lot. Well, yes, it does move a little bit. Like I can shake the truss, which is why we're installing the truss uh, web bottom cord web stiffener, which is what we call our wind tie. But also you guys are mounted in the scissor lift and you can tell here, I can shake the scissor lift. I mean, it's not going anywhere. It just has some looseness to it. The building, however, it's not gonna go anywhere because we do have it permanently braced. So just to get that out of the way, I know I always get that question. You'll see at the very end down there, it's attached right on a post location. So we mark out all the bottom cord of our trusses so that this wind tie can run from one end of the building to the other end and our posts are lined up. And what that does is adds a bunch of rigidity to the bottom cord. So once this is all nailed together, remember how much that shook? Now I can't shake that. And that's important because when the load is applied, let's say a big snowfall, and it tries squishing down the top cord, the bottom cord will kind of get squashed out of the way. And when you don't keep your truss perfectly over top of each other, that's when they collapse. This bottom cord stiffener is very important. Most of the time, your truss manufacturer, all the time actually, they should give you a, uh, a piece of paper or printout or something that shows you uh, where you need to apply stiffeners. After using a battery only nailer, those are great. They do operate very well. They drive nails very well, um, but the first time anybody picks one up, they're gonna say the same thing. Wow, this is heavy. Because they almost weigh 
I think 50% more than the Paslo. So this weighs in around seven pounds and the battery powered Milwaukee, which is a great nailer, I think it weighs in over 11 pounds. That's a big difference when you're carrying it around, when you're using it above your head, when you're up here in these trusses. And so by using the fuel with the battery, you get to shave off a lot of weight. This uses combustion to fire a piston. You don't have all these electronics and these things that are going on inside a, a battery only nailer. Weight is gonna be the biggest positive, the weight and ergonomics of the pass load versus a battery only nailer. Now here on the end, I'm gonna take a 60 penny and I'm gonna drive it straight into this column. Now there's something that the pass load can't do and that's, it's not driving a 60 penny nail at all. It, it can max out at three and a quarter. So we're not going to be driving any 60 pennies anytime soon. All right. So I think you guys probably get the picture. These are the wind ties that you maybe hear us talk about. These are important for the bottom cord stiffening. And I'm going to go ahead. I've got two more rows to do over here. And then the next thing will be what we call a kicker. And I'll show you that as well. That's going to support or I should say it's going to connect the bottom cord to the top cord so that way they can be uh, together and not move independently, which adds a ton of rigidity when an end wall is getting hit with a large windstorm. Even though it is winter, uh, it's below freezing right now, that's not that cold and most tools should operate. However, some of the battery powered nailers don't work very well when it gets cold. With pass load, uh, put the battery in, put the fuel in, and you're usually good to go down to 14. Now I will say, one thing I've always done to help with that, go ahead and take your fuel, make sure it's warm first, but if you're out on site, just stick it down in your, uh, in your coat, get it close to your body, get the fuel warm, that way when you start, uh, it's good to go. And as long as you're continuously using your nailer, the nailer itself will stay warm just by the sheer combustion and heat that is generated when using it. But with the battery powered nailers, uh, sometimes the electronics, they just have an automatic shutdown. Not sometimes, they do have an automatic shutdown at a certain temperature. Don't have to worry about that a ton here in Northern Illinois, although it does get pretty cold sometimes. So now the next thing that we wanna do is kind of connect our roof deck to our bottom cord. And we do that with what we call a kicker. So here on this side of the post, we're gonna run uh, some two by six material on an angle from the bottom cord all the way up to the top cord on an angle. So that's going to, in, in essence, if wind hits the side of, or the end of this building, what that's gonna do is it's going to lock in the roof diaphragm strength that we're gonna have with that steel and the bottom wind tie together so that it doesn't, it's not able to push independently the wall and move this whole bottom cord while keeping the roof solid because you got to remember once all of our steel is on the exterior and we get that full building diaphragm the wind hitting the roof it's not going to be able to move it because it's all locked in to our walls and that's locked into our foundation but the end could push and i've seen this in a heavy windstorm with older buildings the end gets pushed in and these wind ties can get pushed right out the other side. So I'm gonna do a bunch of math. I'm not gonna bore you with the math because I think I've done that video before, um, but I'm gonna figure out where this triangle is based on where all my post locations are and we'll cut those uh, down on the sawhorses. So the beauty of it is I've actually got a note on my uh, phone here and I've you know, been doing this a long time and I used to figure it out every time. And then I thought, why don't I save the dimension? Cause it never changes. So I actually have down what I need to cut these at. I'm gonna cut one just because I'm always like, uh, I think this is the right one. Five and an eighth pitch. And I'm actually gonna do the exact same pitch on the other end, kind of opposite each other. So eight foot six should be my point. All right, 
right, so that is probably worth checking just to make sure it's, uh, it's right before I do all of them. Well, that's good news. You being safe up there, Greg? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Well, the good news is that's a perfect cut. So we're gonna go ahead and cut three more because I've got four of the same post. And then I gotta go to the next size up because as my posts get closer to the peak, my angles get longer. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and do this anyway because I know people are gonna wanna know. We're gonna be looking at this like so. This is the wall, okay? This is the post going way up. And I got my truss that's installed kind of on the outside. And then over here, I've got another truss and another truss being this being my ceiling. Okay. And then way down here, I got another wall and in between here, more trusses. But what we're worried about is we want this that we just installed with all those wind ties and this, which is all of our purlins to kind of act together so that when wind forces are being pushed on this wall, it doesn't just bow it in and pop out the other side. So what we're gonna do is install cross braces or angle braces, we call kickers, like this. So now when wind hits this, it's gonna hit this angle brace and go up and push against the roof, which this diaphragm is tied into our walls. Everything is nice and solid. Vice versa, if it comes in from the other way, we've got all this nice bracing. And to figure this out, it's just, you gotta use, um, you gotta use your Pythagorean theorem or your math and in my case, I use the app on my calculator, but I know this height here by calculating rise over run. So at each post location, I know each post is, you know, from the end, eight foot centers on the ends, you know, from the end, it goes eight foot, 16 foot, 24 foot. So I can find from, from the outside, let's say we're looking at a truss, nice triangle, I know, and I've got a post and a post and I've got posts like this, I know my first post in is eight foot. So this is a 412 pitch, which will give me my height here. So once I know this location, that means now I know this location. I know this distance here because it's eight foot from this edge. So all my trusses are eight foot. So I can use this dimension and this dimension to determine what this dimension is. And then that's how I get um, the angle dimension, the diagonal cut, for my kickers. And I'm gonna do that for each post location. So the goal is that we did our math so that the bottom of this point here goes right here at the bottom of the heel. And the equal but opposite uh, point on the other end of this board is gonna go up at the top cord of the truss. And that's a good sign when it sits, I mean, you can see that I'm not faking that. That sits perfectly right where it belongs. You can see right here where it goes up. It's seated also very nice. And if you look at the very top of that board, you'll notice that it's sitting right where the top cord meets that kicker board. So we know that everything is right because math never lies. Now, the other thing that we're gonna not do yet is we're actually not gonna fasten that top. And the reason is we don't wanna lock our roof in at this point because we haven't had time to square it, to plumb it, to uh, plumb the building, the walls, square the roof structure, square the peak to the eaves. All of that stuff will come at a later date when we're ready to put our roof steel on. And then once we have everything locked in, we get our first couple sheets of steel from the end we'll go ahead and nail those because then we know everything is where it needs to be and where we want it to be permanently locked down. You know, especially when you're working overhead like this, it's just really nice to have a little bit of a lighter weight tool.
All right, so we just wrapped up our wind ties. We got our kickers done, our angle braces up in our trusses. Now, the one thing I wanna say, don't just follow our set of rules, I guess, on our permanent bracing. You wanna make sure that you work with whoever is engineering your design to make sure that you're doing the proper bracing. So that being said, we now have one more set of permanent bracing we need to do, and it involves these chains back here. So Greg's back here getting our corner bracket ripped off so we can run our grade board. And once we get that grade board installed, but then we can start installing our wall permanent bracing. Okay, so you're gonna see what we do here, but basically where these chains are, those chains are holding our walls perfectly plumb and where we want them during this framing stage, but I'm gonna install some X bracing that will be permanent inside the wall cavity and we'll maintain that plumb, not just until we get our steel on, but it'll add additional rigidity to the wall structure uh, for the life of the building. Now with our uh, corner boards, our X bracing, it's gonna be the exact same process as our kickers. I'm gonna use my square, I use some math, and actually I've already got the, uh, I've already got my side walls in my uh, phone note, and I don't have the end walls figured yet, so I'll have to figure those. We'll go ahead and cut up our side wall double X, and we'll go ahead and get that installed first. Always do a test cut especially if you're going off of maybe memory or something like that, instead of, in my case, cutting eight boards and realizing I messed up. Now this, this uh, detail, this permanent bracing detail came from a commercial building that we had to build. It was an 80 by 200. They had us do this double X brace on this end wall with a monster door. And I thought to myself, if that is the engineer design on an 18 foot tall wall, maybe a 34 foot end door on an 80 foot end wall, if that is the design that they're telling me to do, then I could, I could implement that into all of our buildings. There's not usually a need for that kind of strength and I would be covered. I just always say, if it's good enough for that, at this high level where we're doing a more extreme case, then we're more than good enough. So this detail isn't needed per se in order to get the kind of engineering for this build. It's just one of those things that we do and I always am gonna do it there's eventually gonna be a wrap board down here. It's what we call a wrap board, and it planes in with the bottom of the grade board, comes into the inside, and then we connect it with another piece of grade board, essentially giving us a cavity inside the wall, a protection against anything coming in and going up the wall like a rat, and something for our interior floating slab to go against. So what I gotta do is when I put these X braces in and I install them, like so, I need to make sure that it doesn't go low. It needs to be up a thickness of a piece of grade board. Before I get ahead of myself, I also pulled out the uh, Stabila plate level and we're gonna check these walls for plumb. The plate level is a great way to do that because it is 12 foot tall. And uh, if you check a wall like this with a four foot level, it's not gonna be very accurate. So we wanna make sure it's as good as possible. Yeah, I'd say right there, right there is good. Okay, I'm just gonna put one in there for now. Then what I'm gonna do is do like a, I just call it a star pattern, but basically I'm gonna put one, two, three, four, and then one right in the middle. So down here, because we are out an inch and a half, we're separated by this inch and a half connection right here, I'm actually gonna use another piece of treated. This will give me something to install my blocking on. Huh. Would you look at that? So since we are talking about pads load in this video, um, I figured this was a perfect time. So I ran out of fuel, okay, that's gonna happen. I actually was able to get uh, all the nails that came in the box with the fuel I got. So you can rest assured that if you, if you buy the nail fuel combo packs, you're gonna get all the nails shot with one fuel that comes with that nail pack. However, eventually you are gonna run out, you're gonna have to change it, but it's super simple, it's no big deal. And the benefit that comes with the fuel and the battery combo, uh, one of the big advantages is also something that most people don't think about. 
maintenance, service. The things that seem so far down the road when you buy a tool that you don't necessarily think about it, but by doing the pass load battery fuel system combo for your nailer, based on the statistics, if you're running a battery only nailer, you're gonna have more issues long before you have an issue with a pass load. And the reason is because those battery only nailers have a lot of electronics inside. They have a lot of things to go wrong. Whereas this system is pretty simple. It's got a firing mechanism that's charged by the battery and it uses that fuel like a combustion engine to slam that piston down and fire a nail, that's it. So yes, you do have to do a little maintenance to your pass load nailer. It's super easy, maybe in another video, I'll take you through the cleaning process. A little bit of maintenance is not a big deal and it takes no time at all. Get some of that pass load cleaner, spray it on all the components, it's electronically safe, so you're good to go. You're gonna get on average 200,000 nails through a pass load before it needs any serviceable work done to it. And a lot of the battery nailers out there on the market Personally, I had to send one of mine in because it was not shooting properly. Probably not even 50,000 nails, but that's kind of the number that people uh, have talked about and the number I've heard. This is probably the most, or I should say the least serviced gun out there for cordless. And I can't quantify that. That's just the statistic that I've heard. So take it as you want to. That chain might be in my way. No, it's not. Nice. I tell you what, the tip of the pass load is great for doing toenailing, which is how we connect it back to the wall. We've got a toenail and we've got a nail that goes straight straight through the point at the top. Whew, getting muddy out here. Well guys, that is the video on our permanent bracing. So I'm not saying this is the only way, the right way. This is the way we do it. We've had success with it. And I wanted to share that with you guys because I've never actually made a dedicated video about our bracing. Now, like always, I appreciate your guys' comments and feedback. If you see something that maybe could improve our bracing or what we could do different, I'm all ears. Drop that down below in the comments. I'd love to read that. Um, sorry if the wind got a little bit bad here today. But with that being said, let's just recap. We've got our wind ties that are at the bottom cord of the truss, and then we've got our kickers or our angle bracing that go from our end post bottom cord truss up to the top cord on the first truss in. And last but not least, we always make sure that we do some wall bracing uh, such as this double X behind me, uh, which right here you can see the double X, you can see the angle kicker bracing up in the roof system. And once this is all done, we put our steel exterior on the building. It's not going anywhere, man. Big shout out to Pazload. Thank you for sponsoring the channel being a support for our, our buildings. We do genuinely like this gun. This is not just a, uh, an ad for Pazload. Yes, they do sponsor me, they, they support me, but I agree to that partnership because I like this tool, because I would recommend it to you guys. And good Lord, once you use it, you're not gonna be disappointed with the ergonomics of it compared to the battery nailers on the market. So whatever you guys take from this video is fine by me. Hopefully it helps somebody both on the construction side and if you're in the market for a new nailer, uh, I'd love for you guys to give me some feedback. Make sure you hit that thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Uh, maybe let me know what the next video should be about as far as content on instruction or how we do something. And I'd love to do that for you if I can. So I'm gonna get out of here, get back to work. Now that I've got that one double X behind me, I can do the other three, one on this corner and then two on the opposite corner over there. And then we'll be locked down, ready for steel. See you guys later. Have a good one.